A couple things about this talk. Um, I was asked to do something on uh, convective initiation as well as uh, mature convection and overshooting tops. And uh, with the latter topic in mind, I emailed uh, Chris Bedka, who I've worked with on the past in the past, and I know he's done an awful lot of work with on this. And as it happens, he he prepared this talk only about two months ago for another uh, training session. So he was very gracious in providing it to me. Uh, I haven't changed it very much because it, I think it was very complete and uh, it, it saved me a lot of time uh, preparing something similar. So I do want to say very much thank you to him. Uh, I think he would have been here if he could. Um, but anyways, the, um, the focus of this talk is observations of severe storms with visible and infrared satellite imagery. So it's, it's a step beyond the convective initiation work I just spoke about. Um, it's severe weather detectability, quantification, quanti quantitative relationships, and climate applications, um, focusing on satellite observations of the top of a convective storm. Um, I do want to mention that I don't think I'm going to go the entire hour and a half. And um, again, I think with the um, room being so warm and everything, that's probably not a bad thing because uh, our attention span will diminish. But anyways, um, some of the uh, collaborators and acknowledgments to this particular um, talk is Pat Minnis. He works at, uh, Chris Betka works at SSAI, and so the people there at uh, NASA Langley supported him on this work. People at SSCC and Sims and Madison. Uh, some of my collaborators, Larry Carey and a student, Ryan Rogers in Huntsville, worked on this, and a lot of international collaborators as well. Uh, just some information on funding support too. So the outline of the talk, um, some short notes on severe storm environments and dynamics just to again get a sense for what satellite observations are really telling us. Uh, they have to fit into some schematic model as we saw with the growing cumulus clouds that if there's a model that you're trying to follow then the, the satellite should provide you information about that model and the same thing goes for severe storms. Um, Satellite-based severe and tropopause penetrating storm detection, so this is overshooting tops. And really, uh, what can you do with this information once you have it? Uh, Long-term storm detection databases. Uh, some of this was said this morning based on the fact that we now have a 15-year record from AVHRR. Uh, so you can, you can start to build a kind of a pseudo-climatology to the extent that 15 years is climate. And then just a quick uh, thing on the Moore, Oklahoma tornado event from an overshooting top perspective. So, so anyways, um, as I did in my previous talk with convective initiation, it's important to define what severe storms are. And so in the United States, there's a very good definition that's hail greater than or equal to one inch. Um, formerly, it was three quarters of an inch. Roughly one inch is obviously two and a half centimeters. Winds of 50 knots or 25 meters per second um, or wind-induced damage. And so that's actually a big topic of uh, discussion in the United States is the fact that, that for tornadoes, they now develop this enhanced Fujita Bay scale, which is a function of the structural integrity of what's been damaged. So if a tornado hits a, a, a mobile trailer or a mobile home and destroys it, it's a whole lot different than if a tornado destroys a concrete building. Um, so anyway, significant severe is considered to be two inch hail or 65 knot winds, which is roughly 33 and a half meters per second. Uh, and only 10% of the events fall into this. So, um, okay, so anyways, the ingredients for significant severe thunderstorms, I think most people know this, I'll just kind of review this. You need low level warm air. Uh, It'd be, it'd be good if you had some mid-level, relatively cool, dry air. Um, I think the reason for that is um, you tend to have a, a cold pool that forms and it helps to organize the convection to get larger scales. Um, so we basically, you can combine the two and get a lot of energy from convective storms, which is measured in the form of convective available potential energy, or CAPE. 
Uh, something to lift the warm air, that actually becomes the biggest part with convective initiation of any kind, is you really need the parcel to reach its level of free convection. So there's a lot of research out there that discusses this problem in terms of boundaries interacting with other boundaries or differential heating or what have you. So the net result, if you have a high amount of instability, is you get an intense updraft. So um, in some of the diagnostics I did, and I, I won't refer back to my talk too many times, but the, uh, the previous one, but in diagnosing whether a new cloud's gonna make um, rainfall, we don't just monitor whether it has an intense updraft, we monitor um, other aspects. Is the cloud tall? Is it glaciating, et cetera? And that allows us to do more things. The main focus of this is if you do get an intense updraft, that's, a, that's kind of a fundamental zeroth order aspect of a storm. But the, the idea is you want, that per, you want that strong updraft to persist over time. And so when you're talking about overshooting tops, that strong updraft then persists from the level of free convection to above the equilibrium level. Does everybody know what the equilibrium level is in a convective storm? Have you heard that term? You know what the trouble pause is? Okay, so the equilibrium level is really the level at which a parcel comes to rest. So a lot of times the parcel will rise and it'll actually go above its equilibrium level. And, and that's just because of the momentum. If you're going upward at speeds of 20 or 30 or 40 meters per second, that's the real updrafts in a strong storm. If it hits the tropopause or the level of neutral buoyancy, it doesn't just plain stop. It'll actually overshoot that. And that takes some time it, 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 um, or some space. It can be a half kilometer or a kilometer. Now that overshooting top depth is a function of the stability in the lower stratosphere as well as the function of how fast and wide this updraft is moving. So uh, that's this overshooting top phenomenon. So it's not only how that there is an overshooting top, it's the fact that there may be a lot of overshooting tops in a given area as well as the depth of the overshooting top. So there's a lot that can be said about. Satellites obviously do a very good job of measuring and seeing the very top of a convective storm. Uh, and to generate an organized and significant severe storm, which would be a supercell or a squall line or derecho or mesoscale convective system, we need wind speeds that increase in speed and change direction, so so-called wind shear. Uh, wind shear is actually very, very important uh, in a number of levels. You need it to organize severe weather because it helps to dictate um, where the new updrafts are gonna form on a given flank of a storm. It really helps to keep the updraft separated from the downdraft. Because obviously if you have heavy rain and the new updraft is forced to uh, develop in that heavy rain area, it's not gonna be very happy. So um, in the case of a supercell, you have very distinct updraft regions and very distinct downdraft region. And organized convection generally lasts a whole lot longer, generally three to six hours. So this is an example of a sounding. Um, typically, we, we saw some of this before where you can have a low level inversion that generally inhibits convection. Uh, in the case of the United States, and we're gonna see kind of a, a rough climatology on organized convection and where it tends to be severe. Having this elevated mix layer or this uh, region from um, whoops, this region from roughly the inversion to some high altitude is really, really critical for generating, if, there, if it rains into that, um, you generate cold downdrafts and you generate large cold pools of air at the ground which help force new updraft development. Um, in Europe, this, this big uh, dry air might actually come off the Sahara Desert in certain times of the year. Uh, I think if you're in like Italy and Southern Europe, especially in the fall, they can get these very, lo what's called loaded gun soundings and get very large convective storms. But anyways, taking this a little bit further, uh, we can have parcel theory, which you should probably be somewhat familiar with by now. Once the parcel's beyond the capping inversion, uh, that means it's reached the level of free convection and you get all this positive area here. That's the cape, it's measured as cape, the buoyancy. That directly is correlated to the updraft intensity, well, to the extent that you have mixing with ambient air. You get the equilibrium level, like I said. So the parcel, 
will go up here, follow this trajectory and be all happy. And then it'll hit this uh, equilibrium level and well, it suddenly has to say I'm not warmer than my environment anymore. I'm actually at the same temperature as my environment or I'm actually colder than my environment. So guess what? I want to fall back down. And so you can dictate then from the stability in this lower part of the stratosphere, if the tropopause is here, you can generate an overshooting top and you can say something about the altitude. And then here's this low level wind shear which helps to dictate um, kind of how the structure of the storm is with altitude. And so uh, a lot of times from the weather service in the, in the United States as well as here, of course, you generate a whole bunch of parameters associated with the sounding. Uh, here's the hodograph. This is a plot of winds with altitude. How many of you have heard of a hodograph before? It's a really, really neat diagnostic. I think um, if you ever launch a balloon, I would strongly suggest plotting the data uh, and looking at the clouds at the same time because you can actually figure out where the clouds are with respect to this. The hodograph is very interesting because the more the hodograph is either a straight hodograph or turned, that dictates to a large extent what kind of severe weather is going to be likely just from the sounding. So you don't need a whole lot of other information. Uh, so where are significant severe weather and instability wind shear present off most often around the globe? Uh, this more Oklahoma tornado event just by chance, it, it was a high profile event in the United States. I'm not sure how many people heard about it here. Um, but anyways, this um, was way on the end in terms, of, uh, on terms, in terms of the distribution of severe weather. It was on kind of one of the tails. Uh, in the United States, we're kind of fortunate or unfortunate to be in an area with a huge amount of severe weather risk. Uh, places in Argentina are pretty well off, South Africa. Uh, again, if you're in, in parts of southern Europe, you, you have some high, uh, like higher likelihood as well as downstream of mountain ranges in um, certain parts of the Far East, or I would call it the Far East. Um, anyway, so, so this is just a good indication of that when we develop satellite parameters based on satellite observations that describe severe weather or can be useful to forecasting severe weather, we should see patterns that are very similar to this in our data set. Uh, kind of the anatomy of a supercell, and Chris focused on a supercell here. This could be a squall line or what's called a derecho or a high wind event that occurs over long areas. Uh, basically, the, the rotation, uh, this is a very, very simple schematic. Uh, what I, I, it's pointed out for the most part is you have a, an updraft that tends to be rotating with this dome or this overshoot here. Uh, with downdrafts in, not in the updraft area. So you, you tend to have this uh, very nice organized structure. And so what the, the talk is going to be focused on is describing the patterns that you see in the upper part of the trope of, of the anvil as well as the overshooting top itself. Uh, from a convective initiation perspective, as I said before, often the anvil shrouds what's going on underneath or if you're going to get new, new convection it's going to be on the back side of the storm. So this is a, from a field experiment that occurred in the United States last summer. This is an aircraft observation of just an average convective storm. We have a very, very nice thick anvil, however, with an overshooting top. And above anvil, we have the cirrus that's blowing off. And so people like Martin Setback and others uh, have actually looked at the structure from a satellite perspective on how do you identify these features. Um, can anybody think, in light of the sounding that I showed here, can anybody think of an issue when you do a satellite interpretation of this, of a cloud that's up in this part of the troposphere and lower stratosphere? Does anybody think of a complicating problem when you do a satellite analysis? We didn't see this problem when we have clouds down here, the convective initiation, but you definitely see it up in this area. Yeah, you, you, you get an inversion. So effectively, you, you can often get a cloud that it, it could be here or here and have the same temperature. So the, the question is, is, are you seeing a cloud down here or up here? And especially if you have cirrus clouds, that are actually warmer than the anvil, 
If you do channel differences to identify these things, you get sign reversals. And so um, Martin Sedvac in particular was very perplexed by these observations for some time and it took some numerical modeling work by a, um, a Dr. Wang in, at the University of Wisconsin who had some really good information on this I saw at a conference in the last year just to help diagnose and solve this problem of um, what are these features like especially related to these cirrus which actually are maybe warmer than this anvil cloud temperature. And so from a satellite perspective, this is what this cloud looks like. And so you get this really nice pattern here. Uh, and that's what we're going to be spending our time uh, diagnosing in terms of, uh, yeah. So you have the overshooting top, and you have this above anvil cirrus. And the, the various patterns of storm tops have been very highly correlated with severe weather. And so uh, the people at Wisconsin, this is where I used to work as well as uh, where Chris works at NASA Langley. Uh, they use the Makita system, which is a software package that helps uh, loop satellite observations. Some of you may be familiar with it already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But um, anyways, I just wanted to mention that uh, this was used to create a lot of the uh, satellite radar loops that you're going to see here. Part of the reason I wanted to get the room darker is simply because uh, some of these things just wouldn't show up otherwise. Uh, we've come a long way since about the 1970s. Um, a lot of times, from what I remember hearing, um, is that um, satellite loops were generated by people printing maps and just flipping the maps. So um, you could actually see animations if you just flip the pages. And so there was a need from Vern Sumi at the University of Wisconsin. I think he got very frustrated one day and he said, it's time for us to develop a system, and they called it Makaitis. So why use satellite imagery to study severe convection? We said a lot about this in the previous talk, and there was a lot said earlier this week. Uh, visible and infrared satellite imagery depicts processes occurring at, at and near the top of the cloud, and that's what we've got to be careful of. Um, the reason I want to use radar and, and other data sets like lightning is because you can actually build in this picture from cloud top to the, to the base of the cloud. Um, this imagery cannot be used to see through an optically thick cloud as it is possible with radar and passive microwave. A passive microwave, you can see through the cloud, but a passive microwave often suffers from really low resolution uh, presently. Um, and uh, optically thick, that's usually an optical thickness of greater than 10. Um, I think by definition, Sirius is about six. Um, so we, we would again, like with the other problems, Time evaluate time trends and spatial patterns in visible and IR satellite imagery to depict rapidly vertically growth during storm initiation, uh, locations of strong convective updrafts in mature storms, rapid cloud top divergence and lateral anvil cloud expansion. So this, again, would be very good signatures of mature convective storms. And these signatures are often, often indicate a strong to severe storm and can be objectively detected using pattern recognition schemes. The primary advantage of satellite data over other observational platforms is nearly global geographic coverage over a 30-year time period and frequent imaging. So you can actually, again, develop kind of these spatial um, maps of where things tend to occur with respect to, say, severe weather. Satellite data provides the only long-term data set of sufficient quality to develop a quantitative assessment of past and current thunderstorm activity. The reason being it's one instrument. Usually, even if you have a series of GOES or a series of, series of media set instruments, in general, these images, these satellite data are fairly well calibrated to, to themselves outside of bias issues that might develop over time. But nonetheless, if you do some debiasing, you can actually um, say quite a bit over time. We cannot determine if the climate change is impacting thunderstorm frequency and distribution if we cannot quantify the past activity. So a lot of what uh, Chris has been focused on recently is just what the climate, climatological aspects of something like an overshooting top data set might be. Uh, one of the other algorithms that uh, has been developed at the University of Wisconsin it's, it's presently called that the cloud top cooling rate objectively computes using a sequence of 5 to 15 minute geostationary satellite imagery. So this is just using the 10.7 micron channel or 
um, to generate a cloud tap cooling rate. This, this product is similar to my convective initiation algorithm only because it uses that 10.8 or 10.7 cooling rate information, but it does not use AMVs to track the clouds. But nonetheless, nonetheless it's shown value in detecting uh, which storms are going to be severe and where. And there's, a bit, there's actually about three papers on on that, so I'll talk about that briefly. Um, rapid lateral expansion of anvils in the early to mature stage. This is some of the stuff that I, I spoke about already, is that you're going to see storms that are vigorous are going to hit the tropopause and grow very rapidly laterally. laterally. Um, and the presence of anomalous patterns within the mature storm cloud top. And so this is a lot of what Chris has been focused on. Uh, indicates regions of strong and persistent updrafts. Small regions of high, high, highly textured and cold pixels relative to smoother, warmer anvils indicate indic indicative of cloud tops overshooting the tropopause or the equilibrium level. Uh, some of this work dates back quite a long way. Um, Chris has been kind of the most recent keeper of this and developer. Um, we can get signatures uh, like enhanced Vs and cold rings. Martin Setback has been very key in developing some nice color com uh, three-channel um, depictions of the cold ring and cloud top features. And it indicates the presence of gravity waves and cirrus plumes above the anvils. So anybody who's really modeled convective clouds, or especially if you've flown near convective clouds, you'll know that the, you, you often get a very bumpy ride. And if you model convective clouds into the stratosphere, you'll see these gr breaking gravity wave features. So this has been known for a while, but you can actually observe these features on the tops of storms. So when you see these wave effects on the top of storms, you're actually seeing these phenomena. Large domes of extremely cold pixels, often present with large, long-lived mesoscale convective systems and derechos. In regions of small ice crystals near storm updrafts derived from near IR radiance, this Rosenfeld uh, methodology is what I'm using partly to a diagnosed storm intensity at that very early stage. And so this is the stuff that they're focused on. This is an example really quickly of this cloud top cooling rate product. Um, this is um, just how it relates to the visible IR. It uses this, this 10.7 channel. Here's the radar reflectivity. This is just one example. Um, I kind of want to get to the punchline here. The first thing is the timing. Uh, you, you get a first signal. When it works really well, you get a first signal um, but on the order of um, an hour or 30 minutes in advance of, this. in this case, this was nearly an hour in, in the case of, uh, in advance of a severe thunderstorm that produced hail that was about one and three quarters inches in diameter. Uh, typically, um, again, this, this was a really good example, 35 to 50 minute lead time on the first severe hail report. So there's, again, there's been about three studies on this. Um, here they are that, that relate to the fact that objective-based analysis of satellite radar and severe weather reports shows that severe storms grow about two times faster during the initiation phase than non-severe storms. And so when you do the histogram, uh, you'll find out that the cooling rate, um, which is the proxy for cloud top cooling, is, is on the order of, it's a little larger but, uh, than um, those that are not severe. And so that distribution difference is what people have been focusing on. Uh, I put this in here from the standpoint of this and the other ones, is that from the standpoint of uh, cloud top features, there's really a couple different, in addition to severe weather detection, there's a couple applications that have been a big focus for Chris and others in his group. One is just how it relates to aircraft turbulence. Uh, the other is for climatolo climatology studies. This upper tropospheric, lower stratospheric exchange phenomenon in terms of how pollutants and moisture get into the lower stratosphere has been a, another area, and I'll, I'll hit on that in a little bit. Um, anyways, this is just uh, moderate and light turbulence, and so if you're going to have airplanes flying over the anvil, over or in a convective storm, um, it, it's not a big surprise, but there is a high correlation between um, turbulent reports and what goes on here in the anvil, especially if the anvil has a lot of features to it. And um, so um, turbulence risk near overshooting cloud tops. So basically comparison objective uh, goes overshooting top detections with turbulence to in-situ turbulence, well, comparisons of overshooting top detections with 
objective in situ turbulence observations over a three year period or four year period just show an increase in probability of turbulence near an overshooting top. So what this says from a physical standpoint is when you have an overshooting top, that's where you're getting your gravity wave generations, that's where you're going to get your turbulence reports. Um, and so this is a really nice figure. This is over uh, Colorado, this is Nebraska, and you're finding out that where there's convection, um, you're getting a higher likelihood of turbulence occurrences where, where the storms are uh, flying near overshoots. So in this case, 13 moderate and three severe turbulence during flight near three overshooting tops. So this is a good indication why pilots need to have weather information in the cockpit. And surprisingly, this is not, um, especially in the United States, the, the, the pilots have surprisingly little observations. Um, here's another example where they were flying over the tops of storms. The thing with commercial aircraft, and when you have a very busy afternoon of convective storms, it's almost impossible for the storm, for the flights to avoid everything. Um, and so, uh, but anyways, this, they, Chris and his group has actually worked with people to implement some of these techniques into uh, FAA systems or Federal Aviation Administration systems that give guidance on turbulence forecasting. And so that's a big application for this work. Um, and an overshooting top, by definition, is a dome-like protrusion. So, yeah, is it a dome-like protrusion above a cumulonimbus anvil, representing the penetration of an updraft through its equilibrium level? Uh, they can be um, generally. This is where, as I said before in the previous talk, the one-minute imagery or the planned thirty-second imagery. One, I, I really could almost ask the question myself: What's the point of having one-minute or two and a half-minute data? from a synoptic scale meteorology standpoint, probably not that much. I mean, how big is a, how much is a synoptic scale wave going to change within two and a half minutes? But from a now casting perspective, especially with very rapidly changing clouds, like overshooting tops, uh, one minute, 30 second imagery is actually very, very beneficial. And I think uh, someone told me yesterday that uh, even in two and a half minutes, you will miss an overshooting top. It will occur and go down within that two and a half minute time frame. So one minute data is actually very beneficial. Um, so they tend to be small in size, less than 15 kilometers, and this has to do with the, um, the general width of the updraft in a cloud. Uh, updrafts really are only going to be on the order of five to seven kilometers in extreme cases, but they will produce an overshoot that's less than 15 kilometers at times. Overshooting top signatures are often present when the following occurs, large hail, damaging wind, tornadoes, heavy rain. So what this indicates is that if you have a large undiluted updraft that goes from cloud, the, equal, the level of free convection to the tropopause, that's going to be indicative of an organized convective storm. It's also going to be something that can support large hail. Um, to get large hailstones on the order of two and a half centimeters or five centimeters, you need a strong updraft. And so when um, the overshooting top shows up, one would indicate that at least for that time frame within that convective cloud, large hail could have been supported. And so some of the work that Chris is doing and I'm going to show in a little bit is how does this relate to lightning occurrence in storms and uh, again, severe weather attributes. Um, Basically, the airspace within about 25 kilometers of an overshooting top is considered unsafe for aviation. Um, and as I mentioned, from a climate perspective, over overshooting tops inject water vapor and ice into the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. This has a significant climate impact because water vapor is a strong greenhouse gas that can reside in the stratosphere for over a year. Um, I would argue that it it's probably does a lot to transport pollutants to the upper uh, lower stratosphere region, and it may actually be good in cleaning out the lower stratosphere if there's something like volcanic ash. Uh, what is an enhanced V? Uh, I think many of you probably are somewhat familiar with this. This is the case where you have uh, a V-like structure at the top of a storm where you have an anvil uh, thermocouplet. So you have very cold cloud tops on either side with a relatively warm center, and here's your overshooting top. Uh, this is not, uh, a lot of this has to do with wind shear interacting with the top of the storm. So as you might have uh, imagined, if you put a rock in a stream, you might get a similar wake. Or if you had a boat going down a river or a lake, 
you're going to get a wake that's going to go like this. Well, this is a similar phenomenon in the, in the atmosphere. It's that the overshooting top or the strong updraft represents a very big obstacle to the environmental flow, especially in supercell thunderstorm. Um, so a downstream warm region uh, is produced by a cirrus plume at some height above the anvil, which radiates in the stratosphere temperature that is warmer in the anvil below, as I mentioned before, this is actually relatively warm, even though it might be at a higher altitude. Uh, subsidence downstream of the overshoot may also have a role, though there have been no observation of this pro uh, process. So anyways, an anvil thermal couplet is, is kind of what they call this. An enhanced V is a strong indicator of severe weather. 76% of storms with the signature produce severe weather within a 30, min 30 minutes of their observation. So um, kind of the, the the point of this work, even though that um, you would say, well, in the United States where we have a really good severe weather database and we have very good observations of severe weather, um, yeah, you're going you're gonna to see these overshoots and you're going to have severe weather at the ground. This is a very good place to do the validation study, but a really str a good region to focus this application is where you don't have radar. Or you also maybe not have a lot of severe weather reports. So places like Africa, um, if you see overshooting tops or some enhanced cloud top feature, that's probably a good indication that you're getting severe weather at the ground, where, again, in regions where you just would not have radar observations. Um, here's just some examples. Enhanced V would be here. But in limited, in areas where you have very limited wind shear, you might get something more of a donut or a ring. Uh, Martin Setfeck has actually done a lot of work on this. Um, just documenting these cases and, and correlating them to severe weather events. Um, one thing I said early on is that polar orbiting satellites, they're available only a couple times a day, but when they are, because they're lower in the app, they're lower in, they're closer to Earth by a huge factor, they may only be 900 or 500 kilometers above the Earth, they provide much higher spec. Uh, much higher spatial resolution. So currently the SUMI NPP veers, IR imagery is at 375 meters, and you get these extremely uh, detailed observations of the cloud tops, which start to look like cumulus clouds. Um, I mean, the overshooting tops start to have a very lumpy appearance. And so you, you can pick out a lot of these features in a hurry. And what it really shows then is that this is where you have active convection and downstream you may have a lot of anvil precipitation. Um, so this, this would be, these are the regions where you would expect, um, well, these, are, these are enhanced Vs. Uh, this is a, a three spectral channel, um, I'm, I'm get, forgetting this word, what do they call that? When you have three channels, you get a three channel RGB, yes, thank you very much. This is an RGB composite of this, uh, so you get a really, really nice picture. Um, and Martin Setfak has helped to develop a lot of this. So, the, in, and what this shows is that in the RGB, you can actually see the plumes of the cirrus above the anvil, so these thin plumes. Um, so the implication there, and, and Chris, um, Chris did a really good job in this case, in the sense that if you have a uh, a cloud set overpass, this is Calypso, a Calypso overpass of an active storm, you can get a very accurate depiction of the cloud top. And um, here's your overlying cirrus, which again appears warmer because it's in the stratosphere. So this is a kind of an unexpected occurrence. And here's your cloud top from the cumulus clouds. And so this is through an enhanced V signature. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of people who've actually done work on this from uh, the stratosphere, uh, water vapor uh, changes that might contribute to climate change. Uh, observational studies suggest you know, how it relates to um, uh, gravity wave breaking, which I think is really, really interesting um, from, uh, to actually see gravity waves in, in the atmosphere. And then um, just w with respect to severe storm development. Here's another example. Um, Again, where you're seeing this, this um, very, very accurate depiction of cloud top. Here's your cirrus clouds. Here's your uh, cloud sat showing this, the, the dome. And it happened, it was a very fortuitous event over Australia where the cloud sat went exactly over an overshooting top at the time it occurred or, or 
in the vicinity of one occurring. And so uh, Fujita, as far back as the early 1980s, had noticed these features in satellite imagery. And so some of this documents back way back to his time in terms of um, overshooting tops and enhanced Vs and what have you. And so this is just an example of how severe weather reports relate to uh, enhanced Vs. Um, the people at Wisconsin have actually done a lot of work to um, you know, compare MODIS at 250 meters to um, AMSR E, which again is microwave. It gives a really low signature to six kilometer IR goes, but also to severe weather occurrences of overshooting top and uh, severe weather detection. So this is just the MODIS, MODIS observations. This is a scattering of them of overshooting tops and how they appear. Um, and it, basically, this hail report is centered in the image, or the severe weather reports are centered right in the image. So you can tend to see that there's a high, this high correlation just qualitatively between uh, very vivid and enhanced cloud top features and severe weather reports at the ground. And so if you take this, uh, data for just, well here, and this is this is this objective, um, I'm kind of jumping ahead, I apologize for that. The objective over, overshooting uh, convective cloud top detection, Chris has been fundamental in spearheading this approach. Just how you would actually develop, this is the method itself, where you would just simply search every pixel and you look for where, everywhere around a given location it's warmer, and so that defines an overshooting top. <clears throat> so it's a relatively simple algorithm, and it, therefore it runs really, really quickly and he can process, uh, <clears throat> he can process over a very large MSG or GOES scene very, very quickly to identify overshooting tops in a region. Um, so you, you start with a visible image, not visible, but IR imagery. This happens to be 250 millimeter visible and one kilometer IR here. And it, it works on the infrared channels, the, the window channels roughly about 11 micron. Um, <clears throat> and so this is the algorithm itself um, in terms of how it actually um, develops things. So um, it goes through several steps, but nonetheless the output, um, oh, this is an objective enhanced V detection schematic. I apologize for that. So not only is there an objective overshooting top, there's an objective um, enhanced V detection mechanism that's developed as well. It's uh, kind of based on a, a similar formulation where, um, so objectively within satellite imagery, you can, you can identify where it's, there's an overshooting top or enhanced V. Now, as I said before, if you understand physically what's going on in the vicinity of one enhanced V or one overshooting top, and you extend this to a climatology, you can start to say quite a bit of information. Um, and this is just where the United States starts to get excited. The enhanced advanced baseline imager promises um, half, uh, half kilometer visible, one kilometer IR, and then, um, or one kilometer and other visible and near IR, and two kilometer and, and a lot of the IR channels. So basically a doubling of the resolution we have now with data almost at 30 second resolution on mesoscales to do storm analysis. Um, this is an example of a comparison between about five and a half kilometer goes 13 based on the view angle and 350, 375 meter veers data. So this is roughly what we're going to be seeing once we get these new instruments. Um, yeah, so this is just again related to overshooting top convective cloud detection work and severe weather. Uh, the, um, in, so kind of going backwards in time, um, a lot of others have actually done this work. So Chris's work is down here. I think this work represents some of the most um, advanced objective comparisons between overshooting tops and a severe weather database than other people have done. There's, there's other methods based on um, infrared pixels colder than the Mira tropopause. So this would basically be if you have a background tropopause, uh, this method detects overshooting tops by having temperatures that are colder. Um, and so this is Chris's method here, which simply works on um, IR brightness temperature maxima. So um, if you plot this for a given case and you plot severe weather um, reports in relation to um, 
actual overshooting tops and enhanced um, V patterns, you, you can actually plot, there's a high correlation then between where these storms moved and uh, storm tracks of, say, hail or, um, in this case, it was hail reports across a big section of Europe. So this, this leads to um, some of the work that was done in terms of the uh, reins reinsurance industry just to develop kind of a, a general if you have an overshooting top climatology, you can actually then say something about what the, uh, how would you insure somebody for, say, hail damage in a given region. This is a one minute data, and I showed some of this earlier, but this is really where the, in one minute imagery, you, you, you're probably finding double the overshooting top simply because they occur so rapidly in time. So uh, this is a, um, a really, really good example of how um, overshooting tops relate to lightning. And I said some of this early on, um, the non-inductive charging process where you have a very strong updraft and a cloud top that's newly glaciating, one would imagine that there's going to be a large flux of ice through the minus 15 degree C layer that's going to help induce charging, that's going to help produce lightning. Now if you look at this from a, a severe weather perspective, if you map overshooting tops and you get a high correlation to where there's lightning, that pretty much points to of all this region that is dominated by high clouds, the, the main points are here, the takeaway message is that um, the overshoot, if you know, you, you probably wouldn't have to have lightning to, if you just knew overshooting tops, you'd probably say that there's a lot of lightning where there's overshooting tops. And so this is actually, a, um, because this method works day and night, um, this is a really good example then of um, over isolated regions where you don't have a lightning network, you could, you could certainly make a correlation between overshooting tops and where you're getting a lot of lightning. Admittedly, where you're getting overshooting tops and lightning, you're probably getting a lot of turbulence generation. Um, and so this is some recent work that was done um, <clears throat> as part of a Gozar project. I was very peripherally involved in this. Uh, only in the sense that I was doing similar research. But this is a storm over Alabama, actually very close to where I live. Uh, here's where we're going to look at total lightning from uh, the North Alabama Lightning Mapping Array, which provides three-dimensional total lightning, so cloud to ground, cloud to air, in cloud, and um, cloud to cloud. And you, com you combine this information with overshooting tops, one minute goes imagery, and you get this very, very busy pattern uh, like this. And so the question is, is, well, what physical processes are we seeing? Um, this is an example of the, the lightning mapping data sets that we have. So these are sources. So every time a lightning bolt kinks and changes direction, that's a source. So many, many sources make up a flash. And if you map this, these sources over, um, say, something like an hour or several hours, you get a really, really good sense for um, where the severe, you know, this is, this is a very valuable data set for understanding physical attributes of clouds. Uh, so basically, for this study, they use GOES 12 and 13 data just to detect, um, you know, to detect overshooting tops coupled with the lightning mapping data um, and, and kind of the directions here for how they are. So some of the takeaway message here is that if you, the time difference from an overshooting top detection, and uh, so this is mean one minute lightning flash rates per overshooting top, before and during after, before, during, and after uh, 1,606 goes overshooting tops. So what you're finding here is that the lightning peaks about uh, four to five minutes before you get an overshooting top. So the physical process here, again, is you get this very rapid updraft that leads then to a um, charging, a lot of lightning, then you see the updraft actually hit the equilibrium level and make an overshooting top. And I think there's applications here for, uh, for some of the process studies that I'm going to be doing. Again, I kind of just mentioned this before, some of the physical processes. Uh, this actually very much relates then to a vertically integrated liquid, again, in the charging process with, within a convective storm. Um, so um, where this, this, this data has a little bit more, um, one of, one of the, I, one of the um, 
this data set actually serves as input to something called the probabilistic hazard information. Um, it's a way of combining a lot of information in a probability related model. This would be something like some of the models I had shown before, the, uh, uh, the machine learning approaches or just these statistical approaches. So if you have overshooting tops and you know where they're moving, you can combine them with, uh, you, can, uh, you can say vertical growth rates, glaciation rate, anvil expansion, overshooting tops, lightning, uh, some of the model fields. You can take a lot of information from model and soundings like maximum expected hail size, vertically integrated liquid, and you can merge the satellite and the radar storm objectives to create metrics for where, the, where severe weather is going to occur sometime in the future. And this has a big advantage for, um, again, telling which, which storms are going to become severe over time. And um, so this is just how this method works, where you're going to, you, you basically isolate the region around an, a newly developing storm and you just generate a probability of severe weather occurrences. This is uh, not terribly different than the work I'm going to be doing, I'm doing that I presented in the last talk, except, um, so anyways, this is just another approach to, um, to showing where the severe storms are going to be. Uh, again, this goes back to the turbulence risk, um, aviation turbulence and hazards caused by uh, convection. Um, I just mentioned this Again, I sh this is probably a repeat. So anyways, the next few slides, um, and I'm, admittedly, I'm probably going to go through this somewhat quick because it's, uh, I think it's pretty warm in here. But um, the, the next section of this uh, talk is pretty much going to be on can we use these to monitor climate change. Some of this was said in this morning's talk because the, we're finally getting a satellite database that's on the order of 10 to 15 years long from given sensors. And so if you, um, some of the work that Chris has been doing is helping, is uh, assessing uh, climatology. So um, anyways, from a severe weather perspective, climatologies are a little bit complicated. Um, can anybody think of why severe weather from a climatological perspective is going to be heavily biased? Uh, because the reports only draw in that uh, large events or? Yeah, that's one reason. So what, what's occurred in the last 50 years that probably is changing our severe weather database? Uh, area of organization, probably because it's stalled in the middle of nowhere. Right. right. There's, there's just a lot more people. I think social media, things. everybody's got a telephone, and everybody's got a camera on that phone. And so it's very, very easy now for people to get a severe weather report uploaded, up, you know, you take a picture, you send it to your friend, or you put it on YouTube, and so you're getting a much, much, you know, the severe weather report database is actually growing quite large simply because of that. And so if you look at 11 years of hail, 1958 to 1968, you know, these have to be probably big events that do a lot of damage. It's interesting when you just step through time here and you get to, uh, you know, 2012, it's lucky any of us are alive, you know. Uh, <laughs> So the reality is, is this is what uh, this is what social media and having uh, a lot of eyes in the sky will do. So the reality is, is this is probably closer to the truth than we've ever had in terms of severe weather or hail reports. Uh, but you know, there, there's almost it's very very difficult that over that 50 or 60 year time frame you could develop a climatology. And the same thing is for tornadoes too. Um, the advent of the Doppler radar in the United States meant that we were suddenly seeing th what, what's actually out there. And uh, so this is maybe more of the baseline with these extreme events. Uh, and the extreme events admittedly might be caused by storms impacting big cities. Uh, and the cities are getting bigger and so one storm does an awful lot more damage. And uh, it impacts, if a tornado is in the middle of nowhere, it's actually hard to get a good rating on it. So this is a long-term database with respect to overshooting tops, again, which has implications for severe weather. Um, so anyways, again, an, an overshooting top database has been used as a proxy for presence of strong to severe storms, offering the, reissue and the reinsurance industry an opportunity to assess weather risk. Um, it actually, to some extent, helps forecasters determine regions that are more or less likely to uh, experience severe weather if you did, or regions, especially in isolated areas where you don't have uh, good radar networks. Um, an overshooting top, 
database can be used to validate cloud resolving and climate models and estimate water vapor and ice mass fluxes into the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. That's a, that's a strong climate implication. Uh, so some of this work that Chris has done has been really, really interesting in the sense that if you just look at, a, this is a day and night, uh, 1995 to 2012, you're getting this really nice pattern, but what you're seeing is things like the Gulf Stream, you're getting more. There's a correlation here between the instability in the atmosphere where you're going to get the presence of long updrafts or high cape environments and where you're going to get overshooting tops. So this is uh, 1995 to 2012 uh, during daytime and this is uh, goes east cloud depth detections um, at different times of the day. And so there's a strong correlation to uh, time of day with respect to instability. And uh, it also, therefore, because of what we saw before, there's a correlation between overshooting tops and uh, lightning. So because one, that tends, overshooting tops tend to be a good indicator of where the charging process was occurring beneath the cloud top. Um, kind of some trends in overshooting tops. This is a, kind of a good example of the high variability that you see, number of overshooting top pixels per go scan. Uh, per year, so you, you get a high variability as a function of year, which is a function of a given um, some, you know, 2000, 2012, this time last year, was extremely dry with a big drought in the United States as compared to this year. Um, this is uh, some of the work that they've done in Wisconsin, especially, as, and Chris has been part of this, just how well do severe storm uh, occurrence as a function of percentage and actual numbers compared to where there are overshooting tops. And you see roughly about a 40, well, 30 to 50% overshooting top percentage max with um, tornado severe weather large hail. So it's not, it's an indicator, one indicator, that's why it would be used in a probabilistic hazard map, uh, product. Um, it gives some indication that you're gonna have severe weather, but it's probably not the whole story. Um, uh, this is just uh, from, this is over Europe. You're getting a, a climatology of overshooting tops, 2004 to 2011 during daytime. Uh, you're getting obviously maxima where you're getting the most heating and instability over land. This is day and night, 2004 to 2010. Uh, this is kind of a diurnal cycle of the overshooting tops. Uh, there's actually a lot of work that's been done recently over Lake Victoria because of the Tend to a, they tend to have a strong nocturnal maximum in uh, storms, so you get this overshooting top signature really jumps out as it should, where you have local instability at night over that warm water. And then this is just a, um, if you, because this method uses one channel, which is the roughly 11 micron, you can apply it to GOES and Severi, but you can also apply it to this very long record from AVHRR. And so if we just step through time, um, so this is 0, 1, 1 to 0, 03 uh, local time over 17 years. And you'll just see how this, um, you tend to get a seasonal change as well. This goes from uh, over the year from January through December. So um, again, this follows the sun and it follows how the instability develops as a function of uh, overshooting tops. Uh, this is the same figure we saw this morning. You're getting this really long record, and if you can correct for the satellite drift over a given region, um, not, not correct for it, but nonetheless, if you can debias these observations, you get a really nice thing. So, um, okay, and so I'm just going to finish off here. I think I have just a few more slides on this Moore, Oklahoma tornado event, um, kind of as an example. Uh, severe weather probability on the day of more weather, um, so any severe probabilities, this is 20 May. This is kind of a, uh, kind of a climatological map um, on where they expected severe weather. Clearly this, this relates to climatology pretty well, but basically the, the central Oklahoma area was in the, the highest risk. Um, this is the, the synoptic map for this particular day. So the environment was very conducive to getting supercells. Um, this is the, the risk area that you would produce by the Storm Prediction Center. Many of you have probably seen these maps. This is the severe weather reports. And this is a, a loop of the actual event. And so we'll relate this back to overshooting tops here in a minute. Um,
So this is the uh, tornadoes, or the tornado width and how it varied as a function of time and space through this whole path. Oh, I thought I hid this. That's why this didn't work very well. Um, anyways, <laughs> I think we're all going to get sick and throw up if we watch that too much longer. So anyways, so here's the, uh, this is MODIS one kilometer IR at the time of the tornado touchdown. Here's the tornadic storm. And so this is the daily cumulative overshooting top um, detections through 2045 UTC. So they're very highly correlated. There's enhanced Vs. And enhanced, there was two distinct enhanced Vs and a number of uh, overshooting tops correlated with this as well. But you can see that overshooting tops were also <coughs> present in other parts of the United States. So here's the case where, again, if you look at the cumulative effects of overshooting tops and severe weather occurrence, they match very, very nicely on May 20th of this year. So anyways, the summary, uh, several distinct signatures are often associated with hazardous weather, are evident and visible in IR satellite imagery. Overshooting tops are one uh, re readily detected feature that is well correlated with severe weather. Uh, an algorithm to detect overshooting tops is, has been developed. And uh, as I mentioned before, Chris Betka has done an awful lot of work in this. It is currently being improved with additional interfields, including visible texture and more sophisticated pattern recognition to derive probabilistic detection versus a current yes-no binary mask. So this is going the same route as the convective initiation algorithm, um, just including more information. High spatial resolution imagery is necessary to resolve the small subtle features as well as very high time resolution is actually very beneficial. Overshooting tops were detected about 50% of the time for severe weather events and current goals and media sets, severe imagery, and were also well correlated with regions of maximum total lightning, aviation turbulence, heavy rainfall, and hail-induced agri agricultural crop losses. And uh, as, as I said before, because this is a very, the 11 micron channel is very ubiquitous on satellite images, or on satellites going back 15 years or more now, well, 30 years for AVHRR, we can generate a very long-term database for these features. So uh, I just want to say again a big thank you to Chris Bedka for providing this presentation. Um, the, uh, there's actually more slides in here, but um, I think in the interest of things, um, the main message has been conveyed in terms of that satellite observations of mature convection, especially overshooting tops and cloud top signatures are uh, a really, good, really uh, active area of research. Um, so thank you. <laughs>